Hey, I just wrapped up a new agent prototype and I wanted to demo it for you. Uh, it does a couple of interesting things that I wanted to play around with. One is I'm going to have a conversation over here. It's going to go to a, a pretty sophisticated agentic workflow of a lot of different steps that it's going to run through. And as opposed to kind of making the user wait for all of that to happen, I want to stream back lots of bits of data one by one. So I'm going to stream back all of the content over here. So first thing I wanted to test was just streaming all the nodes of a complicated workflow. And I'm going to be using LangGraph for this. Uh, the second thing I was interested in was just building kind of a user experience that lives beyond just the chat window. So when I'm chatting with this thing, I want it to be extracting information that kind of persists beyond this message and allows me to come in here and collaborate with this as well. So we can kind of have a back and forth experience here. And then the third thing, if I refresh this, is I was really just interested in kind of the new limits of agentic workflows within Copilot experiences, given that we can now use Llama 3 and Grok's super fast inference speed. So I was curious in just kind of experiencing what it's like to have a big agent workflow that I'm, uh, you know, kicking off but collaborating with. Um, and it's been really cool because because Grok is so fast, I can have, you know, 10 steps or something that's fired off there. And there's kind of like iterative steps that are happening. Uh, but it isn't actually that slow as a user. So it's been really cool to play with and kind of figure out what are these future of uh, agent powered kind of co-pilot experiences where you can have a human in the loop uh, as opposed to just kind of kicking off an agent and walking away for a few minutes. I think it's already super possible uh, to just, you know, run those things, get a response back fast enough that it doesn't feel that delayed and be able to have a collaborative back and forth experience with an agent. So I think that's super cool and that's probably only gonna get better and better really quickly. Um, so I'll run through a bunch of these things now. Um, I think the first one is probably just what was I trying to build here? And once we do that, then we'll go into the, uh, you know, what the agent is. Uh, so the reason I use an agent for this is I'm having a conversation. Uh, I want to build a bunch of tools that are for product teams that are kind of like don't necessarily have a, a PM. So if I think of myself, I'm just me building these things. I don't have a product team. Uh, how can I kind of use AI to do a lot more brainstorming and do a better job of going through and like rapidly going through ideas and coming up with the most important aspects. So I wanted to build some tools for that. And the very first tool that you do is kind of what is a, you know, establishing a product vision. Um, so this tool is supposed to just help me brainstorm and think through this process really rapidly. And what it does is I give it just kind of a rough input here. So I want to build AI products for PMs who want to supercharge their strategic thinking and product discovery. Uh, I do believe this, but the future of software development is going to be really AI automated. And now the really critical part, I think, is uh, going through that handoff process really well and having better kind of product definition and product ideation early on. So I think the, the product part is going to become really, you know, it's always been important. But if you have AI developers, I think it's going to be even more crucial to have a really good handoff between those ideas to developers. So that's what I gave this tool. Um, and what I wanted to do is basically, you know, this has got some nuggets of information in here, but maybe it's not that smart. Uh, so what I wanted to do is kind of go through and first extract out kind of a bunch of core ideas from it. So it's going to pull out the business objectives that I may be mentioning. It's going to identify some customer problems, some critical insights, enabling technologies, things like that. And I kind of cut it off here just for the demo, so I didn't build all these bottom ones. Um, and it's going to just extract those kind of nuggets from each of those. And so that's what this step is over here. So if I refresh and kick this off again, you'll see it goes through and the agent is grabbing each of those and, and pulling that out of my message here. And then once it does that, I'm going to pass it over to another kind of vision writing agent. And I want that, this is, I don't know, maybe unnecessary, but I wanted it to kind of go through a couple of steps. So the first one just writes an outline, then another person writes a statement. It gets handed over to an editor who kind of reviews that against some kind of guidelines for what a good vision statement is, and then passes it back to the writer again to kind of rewrite with those edits. And then once it does that, so that's kind of building the, the right half of the screen here. We finally need to, you know, write something back to the user. Uh, so it goes back to a, a question writer that now kind of thinks about the the vision statement that finished and identifies some missing data, what would make it better, and then is able to kind of answer or ask a few more questions. So this is applying some kind of basic kind of product frameworks um, just to do product vision at the highest level. 
And I figure once you have a good, well-defined product vision, we're going to be using that for a lot more kind of downstream events. So when I'm thinking of individual features or if I'm trying to identify uh, different problems, I think this is going to be helpful to have kind of a, a cohesive product vision. So that's why I started with this. And I thought it would be interesting to do this kind of break it down and build it back up because it helps me, you know, I'm often going to come with an idea, which is a solution to something. And I wanted to first kind of figure out how do I identify the problem for what you mentioned and then like rebuild a solution that makes sense. So, you know, if it's just me, I'm often jumping to the wrong conclusion. And so I want to use a tool that helps me kind of take a step back, rethink things and then and then dive in. Um, so that's how this agent works. This is all coordinated with LangGraph, so it's going to kind of bounce between all of those different steps and hand it back over. And the cool thing here now is that's a lot of steps, but we saw how fast that can now kind of fly through these. And what I built this with, this is entirely using uh, Llama 3. So it's the new 70 billion model from, from Meta, which is like really awesome. And then I'm using Grok. Uh, so Grok I'm using as the my inference engine, I guess. Uh, so this is kind of serverless. And if you haven't used Grok, this is just amazing. So this is going to be running the 70 billion model. And the inference speed is, yeah, 300 tokens per second. Uh, and so this is super cool because humans probably read, I don't know, 20 to 50 tokens per second or something. So if chat GPT, I think GPT-4 kind of comes in somewhere around there. You're kind of reading as it comes in and that's not too bad. But when you're trying to power an agent, uh, we're going to need these much higher token speeds. And that is allowing them to kind of have these conversations really rapidly because they can read it basically, you know, instantaneously. Uh, so the faster we generate this, the faster we can kind of bounce between all of this. And so Grok is not public yet. Uh, you know, I'm playing around with just kind of a, a, a demo key. Um, but I think just the fact that Grok exists means that everything is going to be having to kind of ratchet up inference speed. Uh, the only thing that's going to really differentiate a bunch of these serverless providers is, you know, quality, what models are they serving, how cheap is it, and how fast is it. And so right now, this is like the cheapest and the fastest, which is insane. I think they're probably just burning money to do it, but it's just kind of showing where the future is going. So it's like, it's not going to get slower from here. I think we're just moving towards this world where fast inference is just going to be you know, table stakes for all of these models. Uh, so using this fast inference speed and using Llama 3, which is also just so good, the 70 billion model at this speed, there's no reason why I would power this with GPT-4 anymore. Uh, the cost is maybe 50 times what what I'm using over here in Grok to use GPT-4. Uh, and the inference speed is so much slower and the quality is probably a little bit better with GPT-4, but I don't know, you have to evaluate those trade-offs. And so I'm gonna power probably most of an agent with one of these open source models uh, that are hosted at these incredibly competitive prices. And then maybe if I get to this final writer, maybe that person would kind of come in and use a, an Anthropic or a GPT-4, you know, something like that to kind of put a little polish on it. But all of the thinking, just the seven or just the uh, seventy billion parameter model is so good now. Uh, so that was really cool to play around with. Is is you know this entire agent running at super high speeds? That is pretty good, not perfect. Um, I'm able to accomplish all of that and do it within a, a reasonable time frame here that I can now kind of have a chat back and forth and think about it. So that was cool. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do here, I don't probably have to talk too much about this, but was it just giving me, you know, foundational models, never train my own models, just use off the shelf. AI. And You know, I can add my own information now here and be like, rewrite this. It should go through and just skip past the extraction because it has it now kind of like give me a new vision with some new thoughts. Uh, so now I can kind of have a, a long term discussion with it within my GPT over here uh, about something that I'm working on. So I'm also really interested in this concept because I think these universal agents are cool, but it's just like so far out still. Maybe GPT-5 will be a little bit better or 6 will be better, but really, I also don't want to have to think about asking it the right questions about my frameworks. I want the frameworks to be just built into a tool. So I think there's still going to be a lot of need for these kind of verticalized agents that do something really uh, specific for you, guide you through the process, because it's really intimidating just to have a completely blank box here. And I think, you know, this is my UI here is still like way too much 
uh, load on the user. So the user experience here needs to be a lot better that I can just kind of click a couple buttons and run it as opposed to even having to like think of what I want to do. Uh, so I think limiting that experience is good. You know, I want the ability to still ask it whatever I want, but kind of go down a guided path if, if it's provided. So I'm really bullish on this concept of just still specific AI focused tools for specific use cases. I think that's not going away anytime soon. Um, and I think the AI and these agentic workflows and the speed and the quality are all there that there's like no excuse for these products not to exist anymore. I think they're, we're so ready for it. Um, so that was super cool. I think that's kind of wrapping up how the agent works here, a little bit of just what I was building, why I was interested in this kind of back and forth user experience. Uh, and then the future of this fast inference and good open source models. And once again, like inference speed is probably gonna only increase, cost is only gonna come down. So I think it's gonna be, you know, this might cost a half a cent for me to run through this whole process today, but it's gonna be faster and cheaper in the future. So no reason for me not to just build these now, assuming that future is coming. Um, and then additionally, you know, this is only works if I'm able to use one of those open source models. And I think it's really obvious already that uh, 70 billion parameter of Llama 3 is so good that it kind of is, I, there's no reason for me to use kind of a GPT 3.5 or any of the Claude Haiku or anything like that. Like this is just better <laughs> in my mind, it seems like than those are at this point. Um, and so they've got a 400 billion parameter model coming out shortly. Like it's just obvious that these open source models are getting to the point where the trade-off between this and using the best GPT-4 class models is going to be, you know, almost negligible. And I think that that speed and cost is just an absolute deal breaker for me. Um, so that was really compelling. Um, just really quickly. Yeah. If you compare that like 59 cents, 79 cents per million tokens to what do we have here? 30 or $60 per million tokens. That's insane. Um, so for anyone interested now, I'm probably going to switch over and just show maybe a little bit of behind the scenes of, you know, we'll, we'll run through some of the, I probably won't do the Lang graph, um, but I will show some of the streaming. Um, so when I actually run this now, code walkthrough time, 